Good evening, welcome to ITV News Time Tees. Tonight's headlines. Missing for nearly two months, Natalie Jenkins' disappearance is now a murder investigation. Her mother is desperate to know what's happened. There isn't a minute that goes by that I don't think about Natalie. I am begging people to come forward. Someone knows what's happened to Natalie. The Education Secretary meets pupils and teachers in the North East and says he wants to improve standards in our secondary schools. 20,000 tonnes of rubbish being cleared to make way for a generation in Sunderland. And... Look, a crab. A crab with no shell. Look who's reading. We meet three-year-old Hariz from County Durham. He's the youngest member of Mensa. Police say they are now treating the disappearance of 32-year-old Natalie Jenkins on Teesside as a murder inquiry. She hasn't been heard from since December the 10th last year. Today, as police released new CCTV footage showing her last known movements, her mother begged for information to trace the daughter she describes as still her little girl. Craig Eastiel reports. It is footage showing a woman walking alone along a busy Middlesbrough street at 5 to 8 at night on December the 10th last year. The last known footage of a woman who police now believe may have been murdered. Natalie Jenkins left her home and her belongings in Thornaby that night with no apparent suggestion she wouldn't be coming back. After almost two anxious months, her mother this morning pleaded for answers. I would do anything for her. She's still my little girl. I just want to know what has happened to her. There isn't a minute that goes by that I don't think about Natalie. I am begging people to come forward. Someone knows what's happened to Natalie. Previously released CCTV showed Natalie in Thornaby walking towards Middlesbrough where the latest pictures of her were captured around half an hour later. Officers say it's the lack of any proof of life since then that have darkened their suspicions. She was very, very close to her family, for example. This came to an abrupt end on the 10th of December. Um, over the Christmas period, no contact, which again is really, really unusual for Natalie. So everything um, taken together, in my professional opinion, would indicate that she's come to serious harm. She's been described as having a chaotic lifestyle. Can you give us some idea of what that means? Yes, um, she was a vulnerable individual. Um, we know, for example, that she was a sex worker and she used drugs. All of these things increased her vulnerability. So again, this is a line of inquiry which I'm looking to pursue. Police say they have had information to suggest Natalie may have been spotted back at her home in Thornaby's Westbury Street on December the 11th, the day after the CCTV pictures were captured. That remains unconfirmed though, leaving police still searching for some other footage or some other certainty of exactly what happened to Natalie after she disappeared from view along here. Until there is any new information, her mother can only wait and hope the suspicions that Natalie was murdered might be wrong. And Greg joins us now live. Greg, have detectives given any other reasons for why they've upgraded this case to murder? And at this stage, are they linking it to the ongoing Nahid Khan murder investigation? Well, Rachel, apart from that uncharacteristic lack of contact with her family, police say Natalie doesn't have access to a, a bank account, a passport or even a phone for many of the essential means of travel and survival. And that's another reason why they think she may have come to serious harm. Now, as for Nahid Khan, the general public might be joining the dots here. You'll remember this is a woman who disappeared in May 2018. She disappeared in the Middlesbrough area. She also had contacts to the Thornaby area, just like Natalie. Natalie, but the police have said today categorically that at the moment they are not linking those two inquiries. What they are doing, they say, they was doing the hard yards. A thousand hours of CCTV footage has already been studied. They say they'll study more to try and build that timeline even further to find out what happened Why to Natalie that night. Greg, live in Middlesbrough, thank you. 
Next, the Education Secretary has been in the North East today to discuss plans to improve school standards and to give young people here the same opportunities as those elsewhere in the country. Gavin Williamson set out how £24 million will be spent as he spoke to school leaders and visited one secondary school that's benefiting from the money. Julia Bathroom reports. Tell me then, ladies and gentlemen, how are the soldiers treated within Source A? As Year 8 English students learn how to analyse their source material, their school is being used as source material to analyse the success of Opportunity North East, the government's initiative to boost children's aspirations. Gavin Williamson's visit to Hetton School comes a week after Ofsted rated North East secondary schools the worst in the country. Would you like to apologise to children in this area? For that. Well, what we see in the North East, we see amazing schools, and I think it's really important that we actually celebrate the amazing success in the North East. But do we need to be driving standards ever higher? And the simple answer is yes. This £24 million package has been targeted at looking at where some of the areas have been uh, weaker than other areas. Hetton School was told it requires improvement by Ofsted two years ago. Head teacher Craig Knowles was brought in to turn the school around. It's amongst the first to receive this funding. I had a 10-year plan when I took over. That's what I sold to the governors, if you like. And um, that's, that's fine. But 10 years is a lawful long time and, and it's two cohorts of students going through the school. What the Opportunity North East plan did for us was it allowed us to accelerate that process. Much of the money focuses on helping children's transition from primary to secondary school and then understand their many opportunities when moving on after GCSEs. Areas Hetton pupils say their school is getting right. How did you find the transition from your primary school to coming to secondary school? I think like the teachers give us a lot of help and like they were really friendly and they give us like loads of support. I found it like quite easy because like the ch teachers around us made it like quite simple and like they didn't like we've always had like support and like there's been independence but there's also been support with that. Has anything happened to make you feel like you know what's coming next? Yes, yes, we have a very good system about that because we, we um, colleges also come in, universities come in as well uh, to tell us like life after school. Yeah, honestly, the, yeah, the, we, we know, we understand that. You know, we, we can do whatever we want. The Opportunity North East funding was announced a year ago but is only now beginning to take shape. Part of today's visit was to explain the scheme to school leaders. It's about North East solutions for North East problems. We don't want something that worked in London uh, and, and parachutes into the North East because our, our view is that that won't work well. We want to be part of making the solution. And if he's going to do that, then uh, you know we're, we're going to be 100% behind him. By working together and targeting funding, the aim is to make sure no child is held back wherever they come from. Julia Bathroom, ITV News, Hetton La Hole. Well, some youngsters can be held back at school simply because of the care that they are taking of other people. Well, there are calls for more to be done to support young carers across the North East. It's estimated that one in five secondary school pupils may be caring for a loved one who's ill, disabled or living with an addiction. Now, on Young Carers Awareness Day, a charity says they risk falling behind at school and in their exams. Lauren Hall reports. Later this year, Erin from Newcastle will be off to university. It's quite an achievement, especially for someone who's had to juggle their schoolwork with housework. So I care for my mum, she's got uh, mental health problems and I just really help around the house so sometimes she may find it how hard to do like the household chores like the washing, cooking and cleaning so I'll step in and help her and then sometimes she might, may find it hard to get out of bed and help my sister at school so I'll always be there to make sure my sister's in school and she's getting picked up from school as well. It's estimated there are around 800,000 young carers in England aged 11 to 16. That could be as many as one in five secondary school children. In their GCSEs, young carers typically achieve one grade less than predicted, raising concerns that their caring responsibilities are impacting on their education. 
It can be for lots of reasons. So sometimes young carers might be late to school because they're supporting somebody in their family. It can also be about um, performance during the day. So young carers can sometimes be tired. Perhaps they've been up in the night supporting a disabled sibling or because someone's having a panic attack in the night, for example. And all of those things can affect young carers' ability to get on well at school. The Carers' Trust says more needs to be done to identify young carers to ensure they get the support they need with their schoolwork. That includes pupils like Jessica and Jaden Lee. Their school recently won an award for the support it gives to them and other young carers. All staff know who our young carers are, so if they are late, don't you know hassle them about it. It's not always their fault. Be leaving our homework, allow them to make a phone call if they need to, if they're quite anxious and worried. So it's about just supporting them in school to be okay, rather than always having you know the big gestures. It's just allowing them to be okay. They offer me different groups that I can go to, which are about young carers and how to get over. It's stuff I help with my mum. It means that I know I'm not alone and I can talk to people about it if I'm struggling. There's also a need to support even younger children. This primary school is attended by a number of young carers and it's been praised for the work it does with them. For a child to make progress both emotionally and academically, they need to have support at some point. It might not be forever, so it could be helping with their homework within school, hearing them read daily, and that could just be enough uh, to get them to the same level as other children of the same age as them. The Department for Education told us we changed the law to improve how young carers and their families are identified and supported adding that over the next year they're providing local government with an additional £1 billion on top of the £410 million social care grant. The Carers Trust says it's only right that pupils like these, who do so much for others, are given some support themselves to ensure they have the best possible start in life. Lauren Hall, ITV News. A hotel in York says it is taking precautions after a guest who's believed to be Chinese was taken ill. Paramedics were called to the Stay City Hotel on Paragon Street last night. The man was taken to hospital for tests. It's amid heightened concern about the coronavirus, which has affected every region in China. In a statement, the hotel group said, following advice from Public Health England, we have been advised that the risk is absolutely minimal and that nothing has been confirmed thus far. The safety of our guests and staff is paramount. Well, in a special tonight programme this evening, GP surgeries across the country tell ITV how they're getting informed and prepared in case of a coronavirus epidemic. We'll hear from experts making comparisons to the SARS outbreak in 2002 and also from British expats who are living in the now locked down city of Wuhan in China. Usually this area should be pretty busy with people. There's, there's usually street food up this side of the street and that side of the street. The number of individual passenger journeys made annually is about 4.5 billion. Trying to isolate anything now is much more difficult than it used to be. And you can see that full programme this evening here on ITV. Deadly virus. Is Britain prepared? That's at 7.30. The police and the health and safety executive are carrying out a joint investigation after a man died at a waste recycling site on Teesside. Cleveland Police and the Great North Air Ambulance were called to ward recycling on Windermere Road in Hartlepool just after 8.30 this morning. A man had suffered serious injuries on site. He died at the scene. Authorities searching for a South Shield sailor who disappeared in the Caribbean have found a body on board his yacht. Mark Brennan was reported missing on the 21st of December. He'd set sail across the Atlantic earlier that month. The Coast Guard in Jamaica has since recovered a body from a boat belonging to the 42-year-old. A formal identification is yet to take place. Cannabis worth a million pounds has been seized by raids in, across Gateshead. The drugs farms were found at five residential properties in Dunstan and Swalwell and an industrial unit in Wrighton. Six men were arrested and a further four arrests were made in Newcastle yesterday. All have been released under investigation. 
A powerful sculpture made from more than 100,000 knives has gone on display in Gateshead. The knife angel serves as a warning of the impact of knife crime. It was brought to the sage following a campaign by Alison Madgin from Wall's End. Her 18-year-old daughter Samantha was stabbed to death in 2007. Since her murder, Alison has worked tirelessly to prevent knife crime. It's honouring victims, it's just proven that when you see the angel yourself, I mean, you can see how powerful a message you're getting from it. And I just want people to realise that, you know, my God, is this, them knives have actually been used in a lot of crimes. This just has to stop, it has to stop happening. It's a real reminder to our region that we have to be working to prevent knife crime, to prevent violent crime. And so I think it, it's a great monument to actors as that reminder for people here. You're watching Thursday's ITV News Time Tease. Thank you very much for being with us. Still to come tonight. With the Six Nations rugby kicking off this weekend, how England's past performances are boosting the sport at grassroots level. And low pressure right by the UK has kept things unsettled today, particularly when it comes to the winds. Warnings in place for parts of the region. We'll have more on that later in the programme. Next, work has now begun to clear 20,000 tonnes of waste from a derelict site in Sunderland to make way for regeneration. The former Alex Smiles plant at Deptford Wharf will soon be occupied by an international crane building firm. The site was targeted by arsonists two years ago, delaying the project, which is part of a wider revamp of the city. Helen Carnell reports. There's little to salvage from this stinking eyesore. So the diggers got stuck straight in to shifting waste the weight of 3,000 elephants. Delighting in the demolition, representatives from Sunderland Council, who've worked for years to bring the exposed brownfield site back into use as a manufacturing base. It's a tremendous day for the city, it's more economic growth. About 100 new jobs that will be on here once the site is fully operational, giving Leaper the manufacturing expansion that they need to continue to deliver the, the first-rate cranes that they build that are delivered globally now from the Port of Sunderland. Obviously enhances what we're delivering as a manufacturer centre in the North East. The heaps of construction and household rubbish had been stored in warehouses when the former Alex Smiles waste site went into administration in 2015, but were moved out for safety reasons during a major fire two years ago. At its height, smoke could be seen for more than 10 miles away, and it took three weeks to be fully extinguished. Thanks to work by the Environment Agency, the area is finally ready for international crane maker Liber to extend its nearby premises. This is a once in a lifetime opportunity actually to expand. We are landlocked with our site here and when this was made available, yeah, we started immediately to look into to make the best of it. Lieber has been in the city since 1989 when it took over this enormous site on Deptford Wharf. With the reclaimed land, it'll now have more than 70,000 square metres of land to test its specialist maritime cranes. That's still months away. For the next 12 to 16 weeks, lorry loads of junk will head to Teesside, where every ounce will be sifted for any reclaimable treasure. At the very least, what remains is an unsightly spot with a shiny future. Helen Carnell, ITV News. Stay with us. The ITV Evening News continues at 6.30. A plan is put in place to evacuate the Brits stuck at the epicentre of the deadly coronavirus. With cases in China rising rapidly, Britons in Wuhan are told the government to send a plane to fly them out tonight. Our lives being put at risk in Northern Ireland's health service, a special report from County Antrim, as figures show another jump in waiting times. And a tribute to the last of the pilot aces who fought in the Battle of Britain, Paul Farns, who's died at 101. Join me for those stories and more at 6.30. Is he a star player? ITV Time T Sports Report is sponsored by Checked and Vetted, the review website for trades and services. In football, Newcastle United are understood to be close to completing the signing of Danny Rose. The England defender is expected to join on loan from Tottenham Hotspur. 
The 28-year-old is effectively a replacement for both Paul Dummett and Jetro Willems, who will miss the rest of the season with injuries. In League One, Sunderland have promotion back in their sights following last night's victory over Tranmere. The Black Cats edged a scrappy contest on a difficult pitch at Prenton Park, lifting them into the playoffs. Charlie Wyke headed home Chris Maguire's free kick in the second half to give Sunderland their fourth win in five games. Rugby. The Six Nations Championship begins this weekend with England's men's and women's sides heading to France for their opening fixtures. The men's squad hope to build on their performance in the World Cup when they made it into the final, only to be beaten by South Africa. Their achievements have given the sport a boost, especially at the grassroots. Kevin Ashford reports. Training night for the latest generation of rugby enthusiasts. And like many across the country, Whitley Bay Rockcliffe Rugby Club has seen a spike in interest in the game after the World Cup. There was a lot of excitement after the, uh, the World Cup last year, or during the World Cup, with uh, a lot of people coming in, a lot of the children desperate to emulate some of their heroes in the England team, obviously getting to the World Cup final. We had a, a big party here on World Cup final day. It was a massive uh, increase in interest, definitely. I loved watching England play and uh, knowing that they've beaten some teams that are like quite quite good. It's quite relieving and it's good to watch because then you can take some of those techniques and for you to use in your games when you play rugby. What was the best thing about it for you? Just like how far England got and showing like that you could get that far if you did well and stuff. I think just seeing all the new players that were coming up and seeing them play for the first time in their first World Cup, I think that was really interesting. Participation levels for Rugby Union have dipped slightly in recent years. More than a quarter of a million people were playing at least twice a month in 2016, falling to less than 225,000 last year. But the RFU says after the World Cup, 15,000 new players turned up at clubs up and down the country, leading to 5,000 new registrations. There was a similar boost in interest when England won the World Cup in 2003 although the rugby authorities were criticised by some for failing to capitalise on it. This time, though, they say they were ready with support, like handing out 10,000 free rugby balls to clubs. What we've learnt since then is the need to invest up front before a Rugby World Cup, which of course you can end up getting criticised of as well if you go out in the early stages, but really important to invest up front to make sure that when the tournament itself happens, that we've got enough pitches for people to play on, we've got enough balls for people to handle and we've got enough coaches and referees to, to make it happen. The 2019 Rugby World Cup in Japan was the culmination of four years of planning for England and the side came desperately close to sporting glory, only to fall short in the final, losing 32-12 against South Africa. Well, things have moved on for the England men's team since that final in Japan. There are eight new caps named in the Six Nations squad, and those in charge say new tournament, new start. Definitely, I think you go through a grieving process. Uh, it's like losing something. Yeah, you work for a long period of time with a group of players. You, you want to achieve the goal and you don't get it, so you lose something and you've got to accept that you've lost something. Uh, definitely had four or five weeks where I had to get over it, but I've, I've found uh, the right level of, of what I need to go for and, and right to go now. England's women, who had their World Cup in 2018, are the current Six Nations champions. Their Newcastle-born captain says interest in the game continues to rise, as do playing standards, both to them and their opponents. You can see how teams progressed over years, like Italy in finishing second last year, you know, there's no um, doubt that that's because teams are pro progressing and some of the, the fixtures and I think in previous years you might have been able to go, right, this team's going to win that game, that team's going to win this, but I think now it's like sort of, it really depends on the match itself. The rugby authorities will be hoping the Six Nations sustains the World Cup wave of interest in the sport. And a few England wins would certainly help with that. Kevin Ashford, ITV News. Well, now to one very young man who's become a big hit on social media. Harry's Nazim from County Durham is the youngest ever person to join Mensa, the club for, uh, for people of all ages with the highest IQs. Harry's is just three years old. He often reads stories to his classmates at school in Ferry Hill. 
Chris Conway reports. Look, a crab. A crab with no shell. Along. Reading to your friends isn't in the script for most three-year-olds, but then Harice isn't like the average nursery pupil. Even more remarkable, he's now the youngest person to ever join Mensa, and his parents say they've always known there was something special about their little boy. When he uttered his first words at seven months, and he can walk at seven months, but we thought that's normal. Uh, until we sent him to nursery school and we have been told by his teachers that he's more advanced than the other students. Harris is a pupil at West Cornforth Primary in Ferry Hill. Staff there say they were quick to notice he had different interests to his classmates. He will go straight for all the math resources, he'll start laying them on the floor, trying to do his own challenges, while some of the other children are like building with the Lego or painting. He wants to go and He'll pick up any book and he'll start reading it fluently, um, which we got quite a shock at, which was then we thought this, he's definitely special. Mensa say they're delighted to welcome Harris. His parents believe joining the High IQ Society will help their son give back in the future. We hope joining Mensa could help him in giving him in a little bit of uh, belief and confidence so he may be benefit this society one day. Welcome home. As for the here and now, his family just want Harris to enjoy his remarkable achievement. They hope he'll be a positive influence on his classmates for many years to come. Chris Conway, ITV News. Oh, that is fantastic, Harris, isn't it? A very handsome young man and extremely intelligent. A rare combination like often, I think. <laughs> Seamlessly throwing to Ross there, yeah. <laughs> it's the same, I'll just sit here and read this to you as you listen to me. Yeah, come on then, what have you got? Uh, mixed day today, I'll talk about the weather, shall I? It's all I know, sadly. Uh, cloudy at times, spells of rain, this is what's been happening today. Uh, very mild, actually, temperatures reaching highs of 12, 13 degrees, so above the average, but really what we're talking about now is the winds, very blustery at the moment. We do have a warning in place across much of the region for gusts of 50 to 70 miles an hour, so potentially damaging there. But as I say, very mild. In fact, that does fit uh, with the rest of the month. It's looking like this could be one of the warmest Januarys on record, and we've done very well, drier and sunnier than average. Will it continue tomorrow, though? Here's your forecast. <laughs> moment of sunshine. Two responses ITV Time Tees Weather. The blustery winds will continue for the next few hours, so staying unsettled overnight, although we do have clearer skies for a time because into the early hours that cloud is going to thicken and we are going to see spells of rain again spilling their way in from the west. But in all of this, again, those temperatures will be mild. We've seen that change in air mass through the day today, but low pressure up towards the north has kept things unstable. We've been seeing areas of rain coming and going and, of course, those strong winds into tomorrow. Overnight, we see the rain arriving, lingering into tomorrow morning. Morning. That'll clear away. Again, we'll see some clearer skies for a time, but just in time for the weekend, there's another area of low pressure here waiting to make its move. So this changeable weather is here to stay through the next few days. For now, though, some clearer skies around, but again, the winds whipping across the region. Gusts of 50, 60 miles an hour quite easily, particularly over higher ground. By around 3, 4 o'clock in the morning, that cloud will start to thicken and we'll see the rain arriving, particularly towards north parts of Northumberland. That's where we're expecting the heaviest bursts into those early hours. Temperature-wise, not too bad, six, seven degrees, puts the overnight lows not too far off the average daytime highs for this time of year. First thing tomorrow morning then, on the milder side for a morning in January, but we are seeing the cloud, the rain coming and going through the morning. As we saw today, we'll see some holes torn in that cloud, allowing some brightness through, staying breezy, not as blustery as today, and highs around 11 or 12 degrees, maybe even a little bit higher in the best of any brightness. Through the later part of Friday, and as we start the all-important weekend, still low pressure nearby, still a squeeze on those isobars there. It is going to stay breezy. Patchy rain spreading its way in from the west on and off, but there'll be some bright Brighter skies and it is at least a mild. Two responses ITV Time Tees Weather. Thank you, Ross. And that is your regional news, sport and weather tonight. Coming up next, though, is the national and international news. I'll see you for the update at about half past ten. And we'll see you tomorrow. Have a good evening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks for watching.